The Brothers Karamazov Novel by Fyodor Dostoevsky Originally published in 1880 This is a great audiobook production, created for research, study, and discussion purposes. Chapter 3 The Second Marriage and the Second Family Very shortly after getting his four-year-old Mithya off his hands, Fyodor Pavlovich married a second time. His second marriage lasted eight years. He took this second wife, Sofia Ivanovna, also a very young girl, from another province, where he had gone upon some small piece of business in company with a Jew. Though Fyodor Pavlovich was a drunkard and a vicious debauchee, he never neglected investing his capital and managed his business affairs very successfully, though, no doubt, not overscrupulously. Sofia Ivanovna was the daughter of an obscure deacon and was left from childhood an orphan without relations. She grew up in the house of a general's widow, a wealthy old lady of good position, who was at once her benefactress and tormentor. I do not know the details, but I have only heard that the orphan girl, a meek and gentle creature, was once cut down from a halter in which she was hanging from a nail in the loft. So terrible were her sufferings from the caprice and everlasting nagging of this old woman, who was apparently not bad-hearted but had become an insufferable tyrant through idleness. Fyodor Pavlovich made her an offer. Inquiries were made about him, and he was refused. But again, as in his first marriage, he proposed an elopement to the orphan girl. There is very little doubt that she would not on any account have married him if she had known a little more about him in time. But she lived in another province. Besides, what could a little girl of sixteen know about it, except that she would be better at the bottom of the river than remaining with her benefactress? So the poor child exchanged a benefactress for a benefactor. Fyodor Pavlovich did not get a penny this time, for the general's widow was furious. She gave them nothing and cursed them both. But he had not reckoned on a dowry. What allured him was the remarkable beauty of the innocent girl, above all her innocent appearance, which had a peculiar attraction for a vicious profligate, who had hitherto admired only the coarser types of feminine beauty. Those innocent eyes slit my soul up like a razor, he used to say afterwards, with his loathsome snigger. In a man so depraved this might, of course, mean no more than sensual attraction. As he had received no dowry with his wife, and had, so to speak, taken her from the halter, he did not stand on ceremony with her. Making her feel that she had wronged him, he took advantage of her phenomenal meekness and submissiveness to trample on the elementary decencies of marriage. He gathered loose women into his house and carried on orgies of debauchery in his wife's presence. To show what a past things had come to, I may mention that Grigory, the gloomy, stupid, obstinate, argumentative servant, who had always hated his first mistress, Adelaida Ivanovna, took the side of his new mistress. He championed her cause, abusing Fyodor Pavlovich in a manner little befitting a servant, and on one occasion broke up the revels and drove all the disorderly women out of the house. In the end this unhappy young woman, kept in terror from her childhood, fell into that kind of nervous disease which is most frequently found in peasant women who were said to be possessed by devils. At times after terrible fits of hysterics she even lost her reason. Yet she bore Fyodor Pavlovich two sons, Ivan and Alexei, the eldest in the first year of marriage and the second three years later. When she died, little Alexei was in his fourth year, and, strange as it seems, I know that he remembered his mother all his life, like a dream, of course. At her death, almost exactly the same thing happened to the two little boys as to their elder brother, Mitya. They were completely forgotten and abandoned by their father. They were looked after by the same Grigory and lived in his cottage, where they were found by the tyrannical old lady who had brought up their mother. She was still alive and had not, all those eight years, forgotten the insult done her. All that time she was obtaining exact information as to her Sophia's manner of life, and hearing of her illness and hideous surroundings she declared aloud two or three times to her retainers. It serves her right. God has punished her for her ingratitude. Exactly three months after Sofia Ivanovna's death the general's widow suddenly appeared in our town and went straight to Fyodor Pavlovich's house. She spent only half an hour in the town but she did a great deal. It was evening. Fyodor Pavlovich, whom she had not seen for those eight years, came into her drunk. The story is that instantly upon seeing him, without any sort of explanation, she gave him two good, resounding slaps on the face, seized him by a tuft of hair, and shook him three times up and down. 
Then, without a word, she went straight to the cottage to the two boys. Seeing at the first glance that they were unwashed and in dirty linen, she promptly gave Grigory, too, a box on the ear. And announcing that she would carry off both the children, she wrapped them just as they were in a rug, put them in the carriage, and drove off to her own town. Grigory accepted the blow like a devoted slave, without a word, and when he escorted the old lady to her carriage, he made her a low bow and pronounced impressively that God would repay her for the orphans. You are a blockhead all the same, the old lady shouted to him as she drove away. Fyodor Pavlovich, thinking it over, decided that it was a good thing, and did not refuse the general's widow his formal consent to any proposition in regard to his children's education. As for the slabs she had given him, he drove all over the town telling the story. It happened that the old lady died soon after this, but she left the boys in her will a thousand rubles each for their instruction, and so that all be spent on them exclusively. With the condition that it be so portioned out as to last till they are twenty-one, for it is more than adequate provision for such children. If other people think fit to throw away their money, let them. I have not read the will myself, but I heard there was something queer of the sort, very whimsically expressed. The principal heir, Yefim Petrovich Polnov, the marshal of nobility of the province, turned out, however, to be an honest man. Writing to Fyodor Pavlovich, and discerning at once that he could extract nothing from him for his children's education, though the latter never directly refused but only procrastinated as he always did in such cases, and was. Indeed, at times effusively sentimental, Yefim Petrovich took a personal interest in the orphans. He became especially fond of the younger, Alexei, who lived for a long while as one of his family. I beg the reader to note this from the beginning. And to Yefim Petrovich, a man of a generosity and humanity rarely to be met with, the young people were more indebted for their education and bringing up than to anyone. He kept the 2,000 rubles left to them by the general's widow intact, so that by the time they came of age their portions had been doubled by the accumulation of interest. He educated them both at his own expense, and certainly spent far more than a thousand rubles upon each of them. I won't enter into a detailed account of their boyhood and youth, but will only mention a few of the most important events. Of the elder, Ivan, I will only say that he grew into a somewhat morose and reserved, though far from timid boy. At ten years old he had realized that they were living not in their own home, but on other people's charity, and that their father was a man of whom it was disgraceful to speak. This boy began very early, almost in his infancy, so they say at least, to show a brilliant and unusual aptitude for learning. I don't know precisely why, but he left the family of Yefim Petrovich when he was hardly thirteen, entering a Moscow gymnasium and boarding with an experienced and celebrated teacher, an old friend of Yefim Petrovich. Ivan used to declare afterwards that this was all due to the ardor for good works of Yefim Petrovich, who was captivated by the idea that the boy's genius should be trained by a teacher of genius. But neither Yefim Petrovich nor this teacher was living when the young man finished at the gymnasium and entered the university. As Yefim Petrovich had made no provision for the payment of the tyrannical old lady's legacy, which had grown from 1,000 to 2, it was delayed, owing to formalities inevitable in Russia. And the young man was in great straits for the first two years at the university, as he was forced to keep himself all the time he was studying. It must be noted that he did not even attempt to communicate with his father, perhaps from pride, from contempt for him, or perhaps from his cool common sense, which told him that from such a father he would get no real assistance. However that may have been, the young man was by no means despondent and succeeded in getting work. At first giving sixpenny lessons and afterwards getting paragraphs on street incidents into the newspapers under the signature of eyewitness. These paragraphs, it was said, were so interesting and piquant that they were soon taken. This alone showed the young man's practical and intellectual superiority over the masses of needy and unfortunate students of both sexes who hang about the offices of the newspapers and journals. Unable to think of anything better than everlasting entreaties for copying and translations from the French. Having once got into touch with the editors Ivan Fyodorovich always kept up his connection with them. And in his latter years at the university, he published brilliant reviews of books upon various special subjects, so that he became well known in literary circles. But only in his last year, he suddenly succeeded in attracting the attention of a far wider circle of readers, so that a great many people noticed and remembered him. 
It was rather a curious incident. When he had just left the university and was preparing to go abroad upon his 2,000 rubles, Ivan Fyodorovich published in one of the more important journals a strange article, which attracted general notice on a subject of which he might have been supposed to know nothing, as he was a student of natural science. The article dealt with a subject which was being debated everywhere at the time, the position of the ecclesiastical courts. After discussing several opinions on the subject, he went on to explain his own view. What was most striking about the article was its tone and its unexpected conclusion. Many of the church party regarded him unquestioningly as on their side. And yet not only the secularists but even atheists joined them in their applause. Finally, some sagacious persons opined that the article was nothing but an impudent satirical burlesque. I mention this incident particularly because this article penetrated into the famous monastery in our neighborhood, where the inmates, being particularly interested in the question of the ecclesiastical courts, were completely bewildered by it. Learning the author's name, they were interested in his being a native of the town and the son of that Fyodor Pavlovich. And just then it was that the author himself made his appearance among us. Why Ivan Fyodorovich had come amongst us I remember asking myself at the time with a certain uneasiness. This fateful visit, which was the first step leading to so many consequences, I never fully explained to myself. It seemed strange on the face of it that a young man so learned, so proud, and apparently so cautious, should suddenly visit such an infamous house and a father who had ignored him all his life. Hardly knew him, never thought of him, and would not under any circumstances have given him money, though he was always afraid that his sons Ivan and Alexei would also come to ask him for it. And here the young man was staying in the house of such a father, had been living with him for two months, and they were on the best possible terms. This last fact was a special cause of wonder to many others as well as to me. Pyotr Alexandrovich Myasov, of whom we have spoken already, the cousin of Fyodor Pavlovich's first wife, happened to be in the neighborhood again on a visit to his estate. He had come from Paris, which was his permanent home. I remember that he was more surprised than anyone when he made the acquaintance of the young man, who interested him extremely, and with whom he sometimes argued and not without an inner pain compared himself and acquirements. He is proud, he used to say, he will never be in one of pence, he has got money enough to go abroad now. What does he want here? Everyone can see that he hasn't come for money, for his father would never give him any. He has no taste for drink and dissipation, and yet his father can't do without him. They get on so well together. That was the truth. The young man had an unmistakable influence over his father, who positively appeared to be behaving more decently and even seemed at times ready to obey his son. Though often extremely and even spitefully perverse. It was only later that we learned that Ivan had come partly at the request of, and in the interests of, his elder brother, Dmitri, whom he saw for the first time on this very visit. Though he had before leaving Moscow been in correspondence with him about an important matter of more concern to Dmitri than himself. What that business was the reader will learn fully in due time. Yet even when I did know of this special circumstance I still felt Ivan Fyodorovich to be an enigmatic figure and thought his visit rather mysterious. I may add that Ivan appeared at the time in the light of a mediator between his father and his elder brother Dmitri who was in open quarrel with his father and even planning to bring an action against him. The family, I repeat, was now united for the first time, and some of its members met for the first time in their lives. The younger brother, Alexei, had been a year already among us, having been the first of the three to arrive. It is of that brother Alexei I find it most difficult to speak in this introduction. Yet I must give some preliminary account of him, if only to explain one queer fact which is that I have to introduce my hero to the reader wearing the cassock of a novice. Yes, he had been for the last year in our monastery, and seemed willing to be cloistered there for the rest of his life. For more audiobook like this, hit the subscribe button, and click on the notification bell so you get notified when we post a new audiobook. Thanks for listening.